Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke. Today we are joined by Dr. Zainab Arda, who is an associate professor and former chair of the Visual Communication Design Department at the Izmir University of Economics in Turkey. Welcome to the show, Dr. Arda. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So looking at your work, you've done a lot of work looking at, at art and identity. I want to talk with some of the identity work you've done that goes back to your original thesis on social media and how identity is used. Explain that in a, in a, in a nutshell to our audience and we'll, we'll go okay, from there. I'll try. Uh, I usually work interdisciplinarily because that's my background. I'm originally a city planner and then I did graphic design, interaction design, and I, my PhD was on communication studies. So uh, trying to put it together, my concern about identity and technology um, started with cyberspace when internet was new in our lives. And at the time, actually, uh, what we were talking about uh, was communication behind the screen. Everything was invisible to us. And uh, communicating in that invisibility was something different. You could be anything you wanted to be. But then came uh, social media in the beginning of 2000s. Uh, 2004 was when Facebook started. And it changed our perception of communication online completely. Because uh, from invisibility of the cyberspace, we actually went to the super visibility of social media. Um, when you look at it, it doesn't seem very impressive, like if you don't look at it from an academic perspective. But the share button did change our lives drastically. And everything about social media changed the way that we construct and we expose our identities. You, you were ta talking earlier when we, when we were discussing this a little about have, everyone's become a mini celebrity. Ex explain yes. that phenomenon exactly. a little. Um, this is like before only uh, media professionals had the possibilities of broadcasting, no? But when we started having Facebook, YouTube, everybody became a prosumer, let's say. Uh, instead of consuming what was produced for them, everybody started producing content. And even if your audience is just your family and your friends in the neighborhood, whatever, everybody started feeling a bit uh, bigger than themselves in that case. So broadcasting their lives, uh, sharing even the morning coffee and you know everything like that. That sort of changed our uh, perception about how we present ourselves. So, so when someone's presenting themselves though with this identity that they're that's <clears throat> may or may not be themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. who are they trying to get us to reach as an audience? Or is it, and is it an accurate reflection of who they really are? Do you, do you become an image or are you, is an image something totally contrived? That was actually the title of my thesis, Image Becomes Identity. Because I think inherently, uh, this is the capitalistic race that is pushing our hand and making us try to show ourselves in a better light, whatever is the case. Now, you don't see people with their makeup run down or their hair messy in the social media. Well, now maybe you do, but in the beginning it was much more uh, pristine, like everybody was uh, showing themselves in the best possible light. Uh, I think that's mainly because of what uh, the capitalistic race is pushing us to do. No? We need to do things better all the time, improve, like increase our income, whatever. So we need to get better jobs, better social lives. And the social media and how we present ourselves uh, pushes us for upward, uh, upward social comparison. No? Um, we think everybody else is always partying or everybody has a better life than we do, which increases the push towards showing yourself better again in the end. So practically, that's it. I don't think social media shows anybody the way that they are, uh, which is not also possible because it's something metonymic. Now, if you post one photo that day, that just shows one second of your day, 
but uh, people complete it into an image and that's why your image becomes identity because metonymically they generalize it to cover all your aspects, all your characteristics and all your life. Is this, is this a global phenomenon or is it concentrated in European countries or the United States? I know you're, you're doing your study in, in, in Turkey primarily, mm -hmm. but where does this affect or is it everywhere? Um, I think it's everywhere. Uh, of course, it started with the states and expanded uh, to cover the rest of the world. But um, uh, I think it's about the show-off effect because um, when I was studying this phenomenon, um, it was the end of 2010s, and uh, United States had the most uh, had the highest number of users on Facebook. Brazil was second. Turkey was third. Which, uh, if you're not familiar with the Turkish culture, may come as surprising. But if you are a bit familiar, it, it's not <laughs> that surprising after all. Uh, we have, um, how can I put it? We, have, we strongly believe in the value of show off, <laughs> which was the perfect grounds uh, for the Turkish society, I think, in that sense. Well, I should so I should note, of course, the recent earthquakes in Turkey, and yeah. we express our condolences to your your fellow countrymen who have suffered so so mightily um, mm -hmm. by this uh, devastating earthquake. Um, in Turkey, you also have an election this year. How does image play into political and cultural life in a place like Turkey? Mm, great question. <laughs> um, this time I'm not going to answer it only on the basis of Turkey. I think it applies everywhere. Because now that we are living in a post-truth era, and there's no way to confirm um, information practically. So we have a lot of disinformation. We have a lot of fake news. Um, and we know, I mean, previously from Ever since Cambridge Analytica, we know that it has a huge impact also on politics. So um, I don't think there is a way to control it any longer. Uh, but um, because it has a lot of impact on people and how they decide, uh, there should be uh, media literacy at least should increase so that pe people can have a better way of protecting themselves, I guess. The reason I was asking the Turkish context, especially given the earthquake, there's of course, as, as there are in all corners of the globe when there's a devastating um, disaster of one kind or another, you have people looking for the government for responses, and often if the response isn't what they're, what they're expecting, doesn't meet expectations, you have anger. Mm -hmm. Add to it electoral politics and some of the other trends you're getting, you have the heavy potential of creating it false images from whether it's a pro-government narrative or uh, just a concerned citizen narrative or wherever it's coming from. How do you monitor this? Or do you think this is going to be a growing problem going forward? Mm -hmm. I think it will be a huge problem. Um, how to put it? I don't see myself really talking about politics much, but from an image point of view, I think they've done a terrible crisis management, not to mention that they've done a ter uh, terrible crisis management in terms of the earthquake. I think a lot of things could have been prevented, a lot of, of the deaths, which is very saddening, of course. And in terms of um, saving the image, saving face, let's say, they also did a terrible job. Uh, because we see, instead of uh, someone that's trying to um, suit the pain of people at the moment, we see someone that is scorning the public, scorning everyone, scorning the rescue teams, which is not very tolerable. And I don't think it's going to reflect positively on the elections for the ruling party. Sure, and I'm not asking here to be an elect prognosticator but it, but it is it is important given given your work in terms of image these trends you were talking about um, how did how did the covid era affect the use of image in social media and, and, and otherwise did it make people want to become part of a group that may be kind of an artificial image 
more so because of isolation, or, or how did it how did it play play out, or do you suspect it played out? I imagine that people are going to be looking at this for quite a long time. Uh, I think people were hit more psychologically with COVID than in any other way. Uh, but of course, having to live your life pretty much always on the screen affected people uh, largely. Um, again, uh, everybody tried to play up, like show themselves in a better light as usual. Um, but in that case, it was much less possible. I think it really got, got to all of us, COVID and its effects. Mm. I think that's pretty much it. But in terms of uh, affecting image, I think technology plays a bigger role. I mean, we got to we got used to Zoom conferences and everything, but now we have artificial intelligence. Um, before, of course, we had co computer generated images as well. So we can actually touch up anything. We can create any image that doesn't exist, uh, not in terms of the image of a person, but any visual can be created from scratch. Just from the example of the earthquake, uh, there was this one image that is very moving, actually, because it showed a rescue team member uh, that came to help the, the victims of the earthquake from Greece. So we see this, uh, this team member, the rescue team member, with the barrette on his face and with the apparent uh, flag of Greece. And he's holding a child uh, with, uh, with a Turkish flag on the arm. Well, even I, I'm pretty sure that scenes like this were lived in the southeast of Turkey in the past weeks after the earthquake, because all of the countries came to help, which was really moving. But this image is not real. This image was just an artificial intelligence generated image which is positive. I mean, it is, it is meant for good. No, it is for creating a, a good feeling, a kind of a solidarity and friendship feeling between Greece and Turkey, which is great. Uh, but having this image circulated by uh, even the most educated people and uh, with great appreciation for this image is actually uh, highlighting danger for us because this image is not real and anybody can make any image that is not real and we can circulate it and we can get any effect out of it so that's the scary part i think and do we really have any way of protecting ourselves from this or protecting us uh, ourselves from the effects of it on anything no politics or public life public space we don't when you look at this, and we're talking, of course, about the Internet and social media, and this is relatively, you know, we're talking about the last couple decades primarily, but you, you have studied a lot of visual art in different forms over the years. How has image been used in the past through different medium? Social media is one thing, and that's instantaneous. Mm -hmm. But artists have always portrayed things as they want to see them rather than perhaps what they really are. Is this really any different? Mm. Well, I think here maybe a clarification of what art is, what design is, would be good. Uh, because currently we consider design as commissioned work and we expect design to fulfill certain functions. But before, uh, the artists were commissioned to create the images. So they weren't actually very free to draw and paint and create images just as they pleased. No, they were paid by the patrons uh, to create these images. So maybe they were the actual designers creating image for the owners at that point, uh, which is actually John Berger's theory, not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, what artworks did uh, to show um, the power and the wealth of uh, the ruling classes at that time is now expanded to everybody with social media we may just just to put it in a nutshell not oversimplifying what we're talking about that would be it i guess you've also done a lot of work uh, looking at artists in exile could you explain some of some of that mm -hmm. work that's actually uh, what i call the artist migrant persona and uh, 
maybe I need to explain why I do Please. this yeah. <laughs> to basically. Uh, design today uh, is not something dealing only with the aesthetics, dealing with the cosmetic end of uh, the de decision making process, let's say, but it is inherent in many problem solving uh, processes for people. And um, as Don Norman, one of my favorite theorists in this field would say, uh, a designer in the 21st century should be a generalist that can actually see the bigger picture. And I come from a series of very interdisciplinary fields, so there's no way that I don't uh, try to see the bigger picture in everything. I try to see the dynamics mostly. And I focused on the artists and their uh, migration experiences, particularly because artists are the ones that put together different cultures. They are, uh, I call them uh, cultural pollinators, as we call them in biology. No, we call butterflies and insects as cultural pollinators in biology. But in terms of culture, they actually uh, work with culture uh, all the time. So they are the ones that have uh, the potential in terms of uh, I'm going to say overcoming the problems, but that's not really what I mean, because I think uh, migration has also possibilities instead of uh, creating problems. And I see the artist's role crucial in that, in trying to turn migration into something that we benefit from, because it creates, it puts together different cultures, uh, instead of trying to look at it as uh, problems of acculturation or cultural adaptation in terms of migration. No, I, I try to see the potential in it. That's why I work with the artists and try to understand their uh, immigration experiences. So where, where are some examples of some of the artists you're, work, you're working with now and looking at? Um, the names of the artists. The names of the locations or kind of some of the um, Well, I did this as part of a European Union project, so I cannot disclose the names That's of fine. the That's participants. Fine. But I've, um, uh, I've traveled to many different cities to interview artists. I did some in uh, Havana, in Cuba, in Paris, France, uh, here in Orlando as well, and in Valencia, Spain, Berlin, Germany. Uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, Palermo, Italy, so many different cities, many so, different so many artists. different cities and different artists from different places. What exactly. are some of the common characteristics you, you, oh. you, you saw? Okay, I, I'll try not to talk too much about no, it no, please. <laughs> because Explain. I have a lot yeah. of things. I think the uh, good thing about uh, taking the artist's experiences is that uh, they share the humanistic values and they have the tendency to look at people with differences as a curiosity instead of um, defining somebody as the other. They run to the differences to figure out because uh, I think because of the job, the professional uh, attitude is that uh, they are open minded already because there is no other way that you can be an artist or a designer if you don't. Uh, act this way. So this allows them to open up easily. They are open to communication, open to uh, getting to know other people. Um, they are keen on the differences. And not labeling people, but opening up the ways to communicate allows them to really uh, create this bridge between different cultures. And I think that is where it starts. Do you, do you see that they're that they the the artists themselves are right are doing their art uh, the subject of their art being the places they have moved to or their original homes mm. or is it a combination? Um, I keep asking them how they define home and I get all kinds of replies. Uh, but I think uh, nobody leaves their home culture completely at any point. But the thing about this, it is that they don't focus on the, uh, let's say, the culture-specific parts of their home culture. No, they don't um, try to keep the symbols and the uh, histories and uh, um, the ethnicities, let's say, but they focus on the parts uh, that are actually universal, which makes it easier for them to 
create these bridges, I think. Has, has this been, been a, a new phenomenon with, with artists? I mean, you're talking about artists who are still active, <clears throat> but is this something that history keeps repeating itself? I think so. I think we've seen a lot of generations of artists leaving their home countries and moving to other cultures and uh, not being assimilated by the cultures because that was the uh, way we looked at migration back then. But they always put these two things together in their work. They always told stories of their home culture and allowed it uh, to be something that penetrates the other society as well. So. So I want to ask about <clears throat> artists and social media, because you've studied both these fields in different ways. Uh, how are artists adjusting to social media? And it, is it a good medium to get their, mm. their work out to the public? Or are they just putting an image out there of who they want to project themselves as an artist? I think it's very difficult to project an image of being an artist. I mean, either you show your work and um, accept what comes with it. Um, but I think uh, even artists are considered invisible if they're not on Instagram anymore. Uh, but then they also have these uh, complicated feelings about it. Not everybody wants to show everything all the time and receive all the critics or whatever. So it's a. Uh, a bit of a dark area, I think. Everybody wants to be visible because, of course, artists also want to be appreciated. They also want their um, art to impact because it's not only about impressing people with the visuals. I don't think art is art today if it doesn't react to what's happening in the society. So um, they're also online, let's say, or they're also on social media in terms of uh, their work in activism, maybe, in one sense. But this, you know, the social media phenomenon is so many things, whether they're pictures or, or comments or, or you know, writings or rantings, depending on who, how, how you look at it, <clears throat> all seem very temporary. Mm -hmm. This is stuff that's up one day and by the next day there's a million more Mm -hmm. tweets put out or, or postings put up on Instagram, whatever whatever social media you're using, when art has always been and it prided itself on being a lasting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So are these in contradiction with each other, mm -hmm. in your opinion? I don't think so. First of all, nothing about social media is temporary. I mean, you may erase a tweet, but it may come back to haunt you in 20 years also. So. Actually, uh, social media means that everything that we didn't record before is recorded and is kept digitally. Uh, we may discuss whether it remains or not, or whether it is significant or not. But imagine you're running up for politics and you tweeted something 10 years ago and you, you've changed your mind, but it will come back and haunt you. So uh, on the permanency of social media, I think there is that. And on the permanency of art, on art uh, being forever, um, I'm not a person to judge that, but uh, depends on the impact that it had, I think. Not all art is going to be remembered forever. Also, well, sorry. No, please. <laughs> uh, one more thing about it is the NFT issue. No, like everybody ran to NFT, and also a lot yes. of people want to invest in art. So it kind of created an area where investors and artists can come together, uh, and it also created the sense that if they didn't uh, have digital work to create an NFT, they were out of it. No, like sort of a fear of missing out issue. Um, but I don't think that is the case. First of all, not all of the art that is sold with NFT, not the most popular thing is the best art. Uh, there is no such thing. And I'm not sure if it's going to be permanent. And maybe a lot of people that invest in NFTs are going to be disappointed. Maybe in a decade, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, you won't, we won't know for a few years, I would uh, imagine, on that. I think so. Well, we just have just, a, just another um, minute or two, and I wanted to ask, how do you go from becoming a city planner to looking at these, these issues that are very complex? <clears throat> oh. 
Um, <laughs> well, I think it's the interdisciplinarity at the core of it always. I, first, I didn't want to be a city planner. I was trying to get to the Faculty of Architecture to be an architect. But when I figured out how it was, I wanted to stay forever uh, because it gives you, uh, on one side, there's all the design and aesthetic components, art theories, architecture and everything. On the other hand, there is sociology, economics, anthropology, uh, technology, of course, the infrastructure, the dynamics of cities and everything. Uh, so it fascinated me. And I did work as a city planner for a while, but my focus was more on the design side of it. But always keeping what's going on with the city as the base map of everything else. So I think that gave me a way to pinpoint the things as they happen uh, and to put them in a bigger perspective to be able to evaluate them with regards to many different criteria. Uh, but then I also focused on graphic design, interaction design, and communication studies, uh, which gives me, I think, the ability to scale things. Uh, now, when we talk about the design of a logo, for example, we talk about it being huge on the wall, but also tiny on a business card or on a screen, uh, just a tiny logo or an icon, whatever. So we talk about its need to be legible and uh, have its impact on both scales. So what I do practically is I think look at things on different scales all the time through the perspective of design, through the perspective of city planning or communication studies. Um, I don't know if I'm really very successful at doing that, but that's what I try to do. I try to put things in perspective in different scales. Very, very complex that. subjects, really amazing <sighs> things to think about. And I, I admire your work and wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank you. this interview as well. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Global Perspectives.